welcome back everyone. It uh, has been a warm week in Florida. I don't know what the weather has been like up north and in other parts of the country, but here it has been really warm. We've had a few days that the heat index, heat index has been really up above 100, although the temperature never got there. But the heat index, I think, got up to like 104 once this week. And I've got some, uh, some friends that have moved into the state. And I told them, I said, boy, you picked a great time <laughs> to be moving to Florida. So uh, we're trying to, uh, to navigate the heat. And I think that it's pretty, pretty warm across the country. And then we've had the dust storm that has come in from the Sahara. What I really need behind me is a, a green wall that I could do a weather report here. That's kind of what I feel like. And the humidity is, and the temperature is, and, and the average low and the amount of precipitation. We had a little bit of rain today, but really didn't even do much more than settle the dust. Actually, it was last night. And uh, so it, uh, it didn't do much. Uh, just elevates the humidity a little bit. But again, I want to I want to really express my gratitude to each of you for continuing to return and to watch our videos. And I really appreciate your willingness to spread the word around and let folks know what we're doing. Some of you have opened your homes up for small groups, and that is just a, a real blessing. And as each of you received the email this morning, those of you that did get the email, some of you just go to the church website and watch the video. But if you are watching that and if you get the emails from us on our prayer requests, I challenge you and encourage you to use that guide as kind of a, a prayer guide uh, if you're having a group in your home. And again, we, we tell you that if you're going to have a group, uh, make sure that you practice social distancing, make sure that you're, you're being safe about it, we don't have large groups. Usually it's five to seven uh, that gather in homes, especially for folks that do not have internet. They don't have email. Uh, they can't get onto the website. They can't click on the link. And so a no number of things. I'm also going to be sending out another link to uh, faithlife.com. So some of you took advantage of that. And so if you see another invite, I will try to include the, uh, the link as well and make sure that you get an opportunity. It's kind of a another version of Facebook, but we are in absolute control of that. Uh, Facebook, a lot of things kind of creep in from time to time, and uh, we try to guard it very carefully. The church Facebook page, uh, that is especially well guarded, and so we're trying to do our best. But for those people that do not have computers and cannot watch the videos um, in their own homes, then they've been going over and they've been invited over to other folks' homes in order to be able to watch those videos. And so thank you for doing that. And a big shout out to those that are opening their homes up to do this. You are a blessing. You are a minister in many rights. So as you're gathering there in those groups, use this prayer guide and just take a moment and, and bow your heads and lift, each, lift one another up for those prayer requests. And then of course here in just a few moments, I'll be leading in prayer. And so you can still take part in that. But, uh, but we, just, we just challenge you uh, to open your heart, open your homes, uh, open your understanding. This is gonna be a really unique message today. It's a passage found in First Chronicles. And it's gonna have a lot of numbers and it's gonna have a lot of names. And so just bear with us as we process that passage of scripture and I think with God's help, I think you'll be able to understand where I'm trying to go with the message today. It's something that, that God has really laid upon my heart. And we're going to be ultimately talking about vision and what we can do, what God expects of us. So it's a challenging time, especially in these days. And so we're praying for one another. We're encouraging one another. We're doing our best to stay in contact with one another. And that is an an incredibly important thing. I know we can't gather in person right now. It sure seems strange being in an empty church, but I've had some folks that have expressed their gratitude of being able to see the rock wall behind me and knowing that that is the back wall of the platform 
they recognize that I am in the church and it kind of gives them a bit of a grounding. And so if that's something that encourages you, well, God bless you for it and may God just minister to you today in these ways. I'd like for us to just take a moment and bow our heads and ask God's guidance upon this message and God's blessing upon those that have tuned in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for your constant abiding presence in our life. Thank you for the peace that only you can give in the midst of these troubling days. Lord, we hear of riots. We see the political unrest. We know that there are things going on between nations and in the economy. Lord, there's a lot of things that we can tie our minds up with to, to worry about. But yet, Lord, you encourage us not to worry, but to pray. Some folks would say, well, I am fearful for these days. Well, we find that your word tells us that perfect love casts out fear. And so we ask you to help us to focus our love and our attention upon you. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds as we look at this passage today. I pray that as we are praying, Lord, that those that are that are listening to this audio, Lord, I pray, and, this, and watching the video, I pray, oh God, that your, your touch would be upon them. Help them to open their hearts up to the leading of your spirit. May they hear from your word. May we see it as a lamp to our, our feet and a light to our path. Help us, oh God, to just sense your overwhelming spiritual presence with us. Help us to be challenged by these words today and to be challenged in such a way that we would recognize that you are in control and that you have specialty plans for each and every one of us to be used to build your kingdom and to be a ministry tool in your hands. So guide us today, Lord, I pray, and help us, Father, to just be drawn closer to the throne, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now again, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 23 through 38. When we are, when we are concluded, you will probably be challenged to read that whole chapter. You'll find that there are some interesting details in the first part of the chapter, but I really didn't want to read verses 1 through 38. That's quite a chunk. And you'll probably say, well, why in the world did you pick verses 23 through 38? <laughs> well, bear with me. Uh, trust me when I tell you that there are some interesting things that we're going to be looking at. This is an exciting passage, and it's a challenging passage. So if you'll follow along, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and the scripture will pop up on the screen and you can just follow along there, or you can follow along in whatever version of the Bible that you would like to follow along with. So let's just uh, take a look at this passage of Scripture and learn from it together, okay? These are the numbers of armed warriors who joined David at Hebron. They were all eager to see David become king instead of Saul just as the Lord had promised. From the tribe of Judah, there were 6,800 warriors armed with shields and spears. From the tribe of Simeon, there were 7,100 brave warriors. From the tribe of Levi, there were 4,600 warriors. This included Jehoiada, leader of the family of Aaron, who had 3,700 under his command. This also included Zadok, a brave young warrior with 22 members of his family who were all officers. From the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's relatives, there were 3,000 warriors. Most of the men from Benjamin had remained loyal to Saul until this time. From the tribe of Ephraim, there were 20,800 brave warriors each highly respected in his own clan. From the half-tribe of Manasseh, west of the Jordan, 18,000 men were designated by name to help David become king. From the tribe of Iskar, 
there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. From the tribe of Zebulun, there were 50,000 skilled warriors. They were fully armed and prepared for battle and completely loyal to David. From the tribe of Naphtali, there were 1,000 officers and 37,000 warriors armed with shields and spears. From the tribe of Dan, there were 28,600 warriors, all prepared for battle. From the tribe of Asher, there were 40,000 trained warriors, all prepared for battle. From the east side of the Jordan River, there were the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, where they lived. There were 120,000 troops armed with every kind of weapon. All these men came in battle array to Hebron with a single purpose of making David king over all of Israel. So that was quite a passage. And we are looking at all of these numbers and you're wondering what in the world does all of that signify to us? Now throughout the Old Testament, there are records of battles alliances, captivities, disputes, and territorial boundaries. In the midst of all, of all of this, were the people of God. It seems that at some point they were the lead actors on the stage in each of these events. Sometimes they were the conquerors, and sometimes they were the conquered. Their worst defeats came when they were divided amongst themselves and separated from the will of God. Let me read that again. Their worst defeats came when they were divided amongst themselves and separated from the will of God. In this passage, we find a people who were united in many ways, multiple ways. Throughout the year, year after year, we have a focus on our individual growth and development with God. This text points us to the aspect of the community of faith. We call that, these days, the church. So we have several points that I'd like to, to bring out as we work our way down through this passage and realize what it's trying to say and the principles that we find there. First of all, God knows that we all have different talents and abilities. Every one of us. We are not all identical. We are different. We have different talents. We have different abilities. We have different giftings that we can use that God uses in our lives. We are all unique. No two exactly the same. Even identical twins are unique they have different fingerprints. Now God designed each of us for a plan and a purpose. You were built for a job that God wants you to do with an intent to have an impact on the world and we see it in that which we enjoy doing and sharing. That's, that's where it shows up. There are things that I just do not like to do. I do them because I have to do them. I do them because it's required of me. But there are a lot of things that I really love to do that are just great experiences, great activities, great things to do. And those things I take a great amount of pleasure in. And when we find, when we find that we recognize the talents and abilities that God gives us, we find that those talents and abilities many times are aligned with those things that we love to do and that we like to share in the doing. Now in this passage we find that it talks about like 300,000 people, right? 300,000 troops. 
and yet there was diversity. Diversity enables inclusion. Because we are different, we enjoy traits in others. Because we are different collectively, we are more broad. Now it doesn't take any stretch of the imagination to realize and recognize what is going on in our country right now with so much division. It's, it's heartbreaking when we see what's going on. One race against another race, one group against another group. Municipalities, states, federal governments, governors, mayors, councilmen. I mean, the list goes on and on. It seems like we're just drawing up battle lines on every side. And yet, you know, collectively, we are more broad and collectively we can get a lot more done when we learn to enjoy the different traits in one another without arguing over things. Now I'd like to sit here and tell you that, that I have an answer to that. Really it's a very broad answer and yet it's specific at the same time. God through Jesus Christ is the answer for unity in our society's problems. It goes without saying, and there have been many pastors that have tried to interject themselves into these difficulties, and some of them have actually been attacked and beaten. Why? Because folks want one way without respecting the other, and they will not, they cannot accept diversity, and they cannot accept the fact that they have to respect one another. That's what's heartbreaking. I'm not placing the blame on any one group. I'm just saying that collectively. Across the board, people have lost the ability of being able to get along and work things out. It seems like every time you hear of something going on, there's a court case. Every time that somebody is faced with this or that or the other thing, there's an investigation, there's a court case, there's a ruling, then there's an appeal, then there's this, then there's that, and it's, and it's on, on every aspect in society and it's discouraging and it can weigh us down because we cannot look beyond the problems of these days. Now folks, I might get just a little, a little pointed here and a little agitated because we find ourselves allowing ourselves to be trapped in the moment, to be trapped in the midst of these circumstances. Whatever it might be, we feel trapped and we don't see a way out. And that's where a lot of frustration is coming from. That brings us to the second point. God knows that people will unite when the leadership works together. And you're probably thinking, yeah, like that's ever going to happen. You know what? It has in the past. And I really believe that it can again. We are challenged to pray for our leaders on both sides of the political aisle. Right down to our neighborhood watch folks and our our uh, retirement and home communities where people sit on boards of directors. We're challenged and we're told to pray for those in authority over us. So what would things look like if the leadership worked together? Now Abraham Lincoln is famous for saying, a house divided itself cannot stand. Now, that's a nice statement, and it's attributed to Lincoln, but it's a quote based on unity of principles at the time of division. Lincoln was using that statement to call the country together when they were facing civil war. A house, our nation, divided against itself in civil unrest, folks, it rings true today, doesn't it? Now I told you that this statement was not unique to Abraham Lincoln, for you find that Abraham Lincoln had a good faith. 
And if you look in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, it says, A house divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. You know who origi originally said that? Jesus. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln quoted Jesus. In Matthew 12, 25, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided itself will not stand. Guess who that statement is original with? Jesus. So you see, division is a destructive thing in any social unit. Nations, businesses, family, churches. Division is a destructive thing right down to our neighborhoods, our communities, our schools. It's amazing the division that can come and it's horribly, horribly destructive. We, when we cannot take the time to hear others and when others do not take the time to hear us. Division is destructive. Now in this chapter we find that even leadership can be inclusive. In every group that I read about here in this passage, there were leaders in each group. Officers, commanders, we are told, and yet they were united. We incorrectly assume that leaders stand totally alone. That is not true. Leaders accomplish nothing without those subordinates, without those followers, without those supporters. People have complimented me on many cases, appreciating what we're trying to do here to keep everyone involved and, and to have material for you to watch, to read, whether it be on Facebook, Faith Life, emails, these videos, whatever the case may be. People are saying, oh, you're doing such a great job. You know what? I could not do this without your support and without your help. I am constantly told by folks, I pray for you every day. And some even say, I pray for you every morning and every evening. And I've talked with them and said, can you throw in a lunch prayer as well? <laughs> I can use all the prayers that I can get. But folks, it's not about me. It's about us. I can't do it without your help. Leaders cannot accomplish anything without support. And the followers cannot accomplish anything without the support of the leadership. I try to be a faithful shepherd to you. I try to be a holistic leader, to hear what you have to say, to solicit your feedback, and we work together as a team to build the kingdom of God and to make an impact in the lives of those around us. That's what it's all about. Now, thirdly, God knows that people will unite where there is a common goal, not a fragmented labor, not self-serving activities, each doing their own thing without consideration of others, we see the results of that, don't we? On the nightly news, and we read it in the papers. God knows that unity comes when there is a common goal, not one of fragmentation and division. You see, striving for the same goal with the same focused has power. Talents may be diverse and individualized. United talents can focus everyone on a common goal even though they are different talents and abilities. The goal is a common focus. 
purpose, vision, mission, values. We have to strive for the same things as a nation and as a church. We must strive together and our purpose is to make a difference in our world for Christ. That's our purpose. Our vision is to to see the, the vast expanse and the possibilities. Our mission is to do it in any way that we can. <laughs> and our values, what do we hold as being true? Now lastly, God knows that talent, ability, and goals are stagnant without vision. It requires vision. Now look at the talents and the abilities. Think about this for a moment. If you still have your Bible open, just kind of look down there or, or remember as I refresh your memory as we read it. Look at the talents and the abilities of this nearly 300,000 men. Did you add it all up as I was going down through reading off the totals? Some folks do that. <laughs> They just operate that way. They start getting a tally when you give them a list of numbers. Bless their hearts. But there were nearly 300,000 individuals. There were those who were good with slings and arrows, those good with swords and spears, those fierce like lions and swift as deer. It says that in the early part of the chapter that some could stand, one person could stand against a hundred. And other individuals alone could stand against a thousand. Those good with intangibles. Now, I want you to listen here closely, okay? Those that were talented with slings, arrows, swords, spears, they were fierce as lions, okay? Fierce as lions and swift as deer. Impressive people. But now we come to a smaller group. Only 200 out of this nearly 300,000. These people were gifted in an intangible way. You couldn't put your hand on it. Those we see in verse 32, those who understood the times, those who knew what Israel should do, those who knew what Israel could do, only 200 But folks, let me be very pointed here. I would rather not have 300,000 warriors if you could give me 200 people with vision. If you could give me 200 people with vision they were the key to the victory because they understood what was going on and they knew what God was going to do and what God's will was for Israel. It does not say in that passage that these 200 people had fighting ability. It doesn't say that they didn't. But that wasn't their key gifting. These 200 had a vision of what could be. What could be. Now having vision is different from having a goal. A goal is a final target. Vision has no finish line or boundary because it continues to reach out and stretch. A goal 
is trackable. A vision, you see, is boundless. That reminds me of a passage in Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. There must be a drive to look beyond what is. Organizations fail when they sacrifice their vision to focus on a goal. Because when they hit the goal, they look at it as a finish line. We made it. But if they have vision, it will reach beyond a mere goal and those numbers, those victories, those conquests will be marked as mile markers along the way and they keep going in business to expand or lose customer service. In churches to grow big, they forget to grow deep. <laughs> So a big company that's big for big sake can't take care of the individuals. And churches that are overwhelming in size lose their individuality. And what do they do? They have to focus on small groups to maintain connection. So I have a question for you just in concluding here. With God, Given the current situation in our country, all right, you with me? Allow your mind to roam there for a moment. The current situation in the world and in our country, whatever you want to focus on, whatever you want to let your mind touch on, just allow it to go crazy. Allow it to go wild. Think about all of those things for just a moment. You have an image? Can you see it in your mind's eye? Can you picture what's going on? Now here's the question. With all of that going on right now, what can you imagine what is your vision with God that the future could look like? With God. I'm not talking about with people in control. I'm talking about what can you imagine if God was put in charge? And if we lived our lives, each one of us, Every one of you, nobody gets off the hook here, myself included. If every one of us could look at things with vision and to imagine what God could do and then to say, as we are part of that army in the same way that it was in David's time, part of that 300,000, if we are part of the army of God, if we are part of the family of God, united with all of our unique gifts and talents, what could we do if we just had a little vision? <laughs> it didn't say that there was 300,000 with vision. There were 200 with vision. How would you like to be part of a powerful minority? To allow God to open up your mind and to grant you a vision of what could be. Isn't that exciting? Volunteer for that job. <laughs> With God, what can you imagine for the future? Folks, I think the possibilities are endless. The world has been through struggles before. Nations have been through struggles before. Have been on the brink of tearing themselves apart. And yet, they've still found a way of coming together. We have a world that is fragmented. We have a world that has lost its way. And we have a road map. We have the answer. 
in the same way that Abraham Lincoln found an answer in his expression about a house divided, he found an answer in Jesus. The answer is the same today. Now we know the final outcome in this text. We know that these 300,000 were willing to stand to, to fight for David's reign and to fight for him to be made king. And he was. They won the battle. They won the victory. But when we look at verse 38, all these men came in battle array to Hebron with the single purpose of making David king over all Israel. In fact, everyone agreed that David should be their king. In Mark 12, verses 30 and 31, it says this, God calls upon us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Our neighbors as ourselves. It doesn't say that only the neighbors we agree with. Our neighbors are to be loved as ourselves. Folks, there is no greater unifying purpose in the world than to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves, and to call out to God to grant us a fresh vision of what can be. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you after looking at this passage and realizing the potential that's there in the hands of people who are united, even when it appears to be impossible. Nothing is impossible with you. And I thank you, Lord, that you can use us and guide us and direct us we pray for a fresh new vision. Help us to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves and to trust you for a vision of what can be. And then to be willing to say, I will lend my talents and abilities to see that vision through. I'll give it my all. I'll give it my best. Speak to us, Lord, and use us to make a difference in the world that desperately needs you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your continued financial support. Continue to go to ogfmc.com. And I just want to remind you, I haven't for a few weeks, uh, that there is a giving tab there that if you'd like to donate to the church, you can do that through PayPal. If you'd like to mail a check, um, if you have more money than you know what to do with and you need some recommendations, give me a call. Send me an email. I'll try to help you all I can. But God bless you for being so faithful. You folks are giving sacrificially. I know that you are. And it is much appreciated. Thank you for maintaining contact with one another and reaching out with the, the limited abilities that we have to do it as a community united in one place, we're still trying to do it as a community united in multitudes of ways. Be faithful and allow God to use you. Amen. Lord, be